Thank you. It's my last time making announcements. And so many more things I wanted to say. Um, first, I'm just going to get the tip jar started. Um, this is for the uh, dining hall staff who've been so wonderful at grabbing all our plates and um, not letting the silverware fall, which is amazing. Um, okay, a bunch of little things. Um, Miriam, uh, give a quick wave. She's got these great unframed prints uh, that are for sale. So take a look and see her. Um, if you want to buy a t-shirt, we're going to be selling them after this reading in the little room off of the dining room right here in the Women's Center. Um, tonight we have another dance uh, and it's going to be at the pub where it was before. Uh, the Nash Tones are playing, they're a live band. And there's going to be, we're going to have beer there, so there'll be free beer. Uh, okay, this is important departures info. Uh, so you already know that you're either going to be on a 5.30 a.m. bus or an 8.30 a.m. bus, but those are actually the times that the buses are going to be departing Sewanee. So really you need to be ready with your luggage either on the patio or in the common area of your dorm either at 5 a.m. or 8 a.m. And what we're going to do is we're going to have vans coming around picking you up picking you up with your luggage and bringing you to Benedict where we'll do the checkout. We'll give you your deposit back. Um, you can grab an address list and buy a t-shirt if you want. And then you'll get back on, uh, or then you'll get on the bus up to Nashville. So um, we'll also be doing wake up calls uh, beginning at 4.45 for the early bus and 7.45 for the later bus. Um, <laughs> but set your alarm as well. And if you drove here, um, you need to also check out at Benedict and be out of the dorms by 10 a.m. at the very latest. Um, the address lists are out, so you can keep in touch with all your new friends. They're on the back shelf there, and they're in McClurg, and they'll be at, uh, at checkout as well. I think that's everything, so please welcome Randall Keenan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for showing up on this rainy, chilly last day of a, of a conference. I wanted to thank you so much. Um, I, 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 before I came here, I was at a uh, family reunion in Washington. Uh, for, uh, we, we, they move it around. And I just come from one of these, I th we all do, but I think my family takes it a bit to the extreme. Um, my great, great grandfather had six children. The youngest, I was very close with my great, great aunt Erie. She lived um, just down, down the road from us and I cut her grass and I check on her. But she lived to be in her 90s when she was in, in uh, it died in, in the early 90s. And uh, she had 15 children, 12 survived. So just her <laughs> descendants, but imagine from all those six, you know, uh, uh, children, you know, well, have a nation of cousins. <laughs> and, you know, you're sitting in, all, you know, w with all these, you know, hundred, you know, like 200 people showed up. And, um, and you, in your mind, it's like in Star Trek, that, the, the star map room, <laughs> uh, genealogy and everything. And I was just, you know, all, I had family on my mind. And then to come up here uh, to Swanee and to have what feels like another family, which is very, so I want to thank Wyatt and Megan and Adam the Great and uh, these, these amazing magical people who make things run behind the, the scenes. Um, I'm so thrilled to be up here. I am um, you know, really honored that you guys have come out on a Saturday in the rain when even I want to be in bed sort of curled up. <laughs> Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is gonna be like a cheese course. <laughs> uh, a palate cleanser, because you've been through a few readings in the last 12 days, and I, I have too. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gonna read four shorter pieces, and, uh, and, 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 and I'm gonna, you know, just give it over to Jesus after that. <laughs> Um, and I also wanted to, to, to acknowledge um, 
my, my, my dear uh, uh, workshop co-worker, Jill uh, uh, Vicorkle, and who I, I call my cousin because I've known Jill so long. We come from the same earth, the same North Carolina swamps. We went to the same school. We had the same teachers. And I just love her to pieces, and she just feels like family. So it's, it's just, it just feels right and just. And our teacher, Max Steele, uh, in his later years, he became enamored with the short form. And I'm a little skeptical still, but I still try to, try to do So I'm going to share some of my, my attempts at shorter, some recent, recent shorter pieces. The first one is actually nonfiction. It's from an essay I wrote not too long ago. It hasn't been published yet. It's about Southern women icons. And this one is about Eartha Kitt. I love me some Eartha Kitt. <laughs> And she was an extraordinary woman. And I, I love long forms. I write, this essay is like 40 pages long, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not that much a hypocrite. I'm going to read short things. This is a 40 page. No. Um, but she, she, you know, she, she was on the charts for, for the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, she died in her, in her, in her 80s. Uh, she, she spoke four languages. She was from a little town in South Carolina called North. North South Carolina. <laughs> she wrote, I'm serious, I ain't lying. Um, she wrote four autobiographies. The first one, Thursday's Child, is just uh, really incredible. She was a dancer. She danced with Catherine Dunham. Uh, on and on and on. But here's this little piece from that essay, which I thought would be a fun way to start. I had gotten in trouble with my friend Sheila Anderson when Back in 1989, in New York City, all full of excitement and self-important retro cool, I insisted we go see Miss Peggy Lee perform. Sheila first said, is she still living? <laughs> but she reluctantly agreed to accompany me. It would be a lark, she said. Alas, at the at the last minute, I had to cancel on her. Why, I don't remember. But she wound up taking a friend. To this day, Sheila ribs me about the event and the wonderful, still barely living, Peggy Lee's performance. Sheila enjoyed it in the end, but blamed me on her being the youngest woman in the audience at the Rainbow Room and the only black woman. About a year later, when I saw that Eartha Kitt was performing at a new cabaret in Chelsea and, had, and was having an early Sunday show, I knew I had to go. For years, she had appeared at the Carlisle, one of those Upper East Side New York landmarks that has appeared in Woody Allen movies more often than the Carnegie Deli. Known for its long association with performers such as Bobby Short, and Rosemary Clooney and Barbara Cook. For some reason, I had never ventured yonder to see her, perhaps intimidated by the posh reputation. But this time, I called up a bunch of friends, Sheila first, of course. I have no idea how I convinced them. Perhaps I didn't need to do much selling. But the next Sunday afternoon, our small troop marched to the matinee, me, Sheila, and four other friends. We arrived at the newly styled ballroom, rows and rows of tables, a stage with black velvet teasers and tormentors, a bar manned by a tuxedo-wearing bartender. Though we were not that early, we six were the only folk there other than the band who, had already, who was, were already tuning up and warming up. When two o'clock rolled around, we were the entire audience. But the show went on. The band struck up a driving tune. Eartha May Kit emerged, begowned, glittering, smiling, great big, and inviting. Whether or not she was disappointed to be playing to a room of six, how could she not be? She certainly never let on. After all, the woman was a consummate professional. She sang as if she were singing to a packed house, full of electricity and humor and sexual brio, gyrating and thrusting and gesturing in a manner that conjured up Paris and Berlin and Rome and Istanbul. <laughs> 
She sang many of her old hits, a number of standards reinterpreted with her signature growl and purr and the imprint of her singular diction. Her humor was a seductive thing. And before long, she was literally talking to us between songs. Her patter inclusive and seductive and funny. She did two sets and an encore. <laughs> All six of us were on our feet and ecstatic <laughs> and utterly charmed at the end. After she left the stage and we were preparing to go, a gentleman approached. Miss Kitt would like to know if you would like to join her in her dressing room. I had visited Lena Horne once backstage after a performance in London. She was regal, she smiled, and when I told her I was from North Carolina, she said, like my friend Ava. <laughs> <laughs> but, Earth, but with Eartha, it was like visiting an aunt, homey and down home. She had somehow retained that southern sense of how to make strangers feel instantly at home. I think she even offered us something to drink. We politely declined. The cliche is southern hospitality, but there is something more to that art. To be sure, southerners have no monopoly on hospitality, but there is a familiar tone a self-effacing spirit of graciousness that I mark as being particularly Southern. Her head was wrapped. She was dressed casually and comfortably in tan. She asked many questions about us and our jobs. She thanked us for coming to see her. We talked about how she, she talked about how she loved being back in Connecticut and in the country and how much she enjoyed walking. Miss Kitt invited Sheila to examine one of her dresses close up, and Sheila expressed admiration and told her how wonderful it looked. Miss Kitt said, it should. It cost $24,000. <laughs> and when Sheila told Miss Kitt that I was a writer, I was much too bashful to admit such an activity. Eartha Mae Kitt cooed and clasped my hand. I love to read, she purred. <laughs> oh, nonfiction. Um, the next one is very, very short. It's something I wrote last, last fall for, uh, we have a woman in Raleigh. Did you, Jill might have, she's a real dynamic lady. Um, and uh, she organizes all these things for writers and she did, a, a, there's a church, a Baptist church in Raleigh and she asked people, she get, would give them a, out of ran, a random these black and white photographs. You couldn't choose it, she would give it to you and you had to write 250 words of fiction about it. And then she did a show in the, were you a part, this is Mamie Potter. I love her name, Mamie Potter. She gave me a photograph uh, black and white, it was from the 50s, and it was of this, this young white girl, and she might probably in middle school, and she's standing over her bike, and she's looking over at this group of young boys standing around a tree, up to no good, obviously. I, you know. So, um, so this is what I wrote. From the, the girl's point of view, just, okay. Uh, it's called Hell's Bells. I don't know what Dickie Johnson is doing hanging out with them rascals. Now I wish we was going steady just so I could quit him. <laughs> and he best not be coming by my granddaddy's cigarette store no more looking for handouts. I ain't gonna slip him no camels and I ain't gonna slip him no lucky strikes. I ain't gonna go for a walk with him after church on Sunday. I ain't gonna sit with him on porch after supper neither. I ain't gonna help him with his geometry homework. I ain't gonna write his paper on the conquistadors. <laughs> no, sir. I ain't gonna go watch him play basketball on Thursday afternoon, even if they are playing North Duplin. I ain't gonna let him sit with me in the lunchroom. I ain't gonna let him eat my green jello. I ain't gonna loan him my bike. 
I ain't gonna listen to him try to sing like Pat Boone. <laughs> Especially since he can't know how anyway. I ain't gonna let him hold my hand. Perry Pickett told me that Eleanor Phelps told him that Malcolm Thigpen told her that Dickie said he got to go to first base with me the other week by Sycamore Creek. He's a liar and the truth of God ain't nowhere about his body and soul. <laughs> and as granddaddy says, liars will occupy a spatial place in hell with little devils yanking at their tongues. <laughs> I myself cannot abide a liar, no matter how pretty his feet is. I shall erase Dickie Johnson's name from my bosom. <laughs> I ain't gonna love Dickie Johnson no more. Look at him, he ought to be ashamed of himself. <laughs> yes, Andrew, I named a boy Dickie Johnson. <laughs> Just to amuse you. Um, this next one I wrote, and Jill is in this one. This next two, you were in, you were in both of these. I'm, we're, we're kin. <laughs> She's my cousin. I'm her cousin's cousin too. Um, we, there was an anthology uh, about our hometown, or the town we live in now, Hillsborough, North Carolina. And I, um, I was going to do a piece of nonfiction for it, but decided I wanted to do a short, short story uh, about it. So this is... Uh, that little piece, which is inventively called Where the Wild Things Are. That's horrible. I'm going to change the title. I don't know. <laughs> but you'll see why. By now, the sight of a deer made Craig Rogers sad. At first, seeing the fawns and doe about the yard had been a delight, like having Bambi roaming about our, your lawn. Dancing. Prank. By the way, I left home real mad because I walked out the door fixing to come up here and the deer had eat all my tomato plants. So I don't want to see a deer. All of them. I had to get that out of my system. Like having Bambi roaming about your lawn, dancing, prancing, the way they would stop and watch you watching them, their delicate, lithe bodies and limber limbs. But then they started eating the baby lettuce he had hoped to grow, mustard, frisee, radicchio. The deer ate it all, every bit of it. And then a month ago, he had hit a deer coming home late one night from Chapel Hill on Old Highway 86. At first, Terrifying, then annoying, then inconvenient, then just sad. Damn sad. He couldn't get the image of the spent creature out of his mind. When he moved to Hillsboro from New Jersey, growing green things had been one of his dreams. He dreamed wild, impossible dreams of wild, overgrown plants, vines and leaves, buds in the spring, eat great dripping foliage in the late summer. He ordered books, catalogs, belonged to too many listservs about gardening. All his life he'd been a city boy, but now after two decades of working as a radio oncologist, his new move to this tiny emerald town had promised a chance to finally develop his green thumb, to get in the dirt, to make acquaintance with the earth. Hello, earth. <laughs> His brother scoffed, his brother the big city chef, his brother who was a creature of the city if ever one did exist, his brother who had not left the island of Manhattan in three years and counting, his brother who couldn't even keep a pot of rosemary alive for more than a month. Hey, my supplier has plenty, what's the big deal? Farmer Rogers, he would joke, Mr. Rogers more like it. You flit from one hobby to another, Craig, just like poetry. What have ever happened to that? <laughs> Ouch. Older brothers are like that. Why bother being delicate when you can make a clean, deep cut? Secretly, he still loved poetry. That thing his sixth grade teacher had said to him never left 
Craig, you have used such vivid language, like, like Langston Hughes. But he was just a poor boy, and like his older brother, had to make sure he made good. Medical school made, made sure of that. But he still loved the vivid, the making of things. Vivid, from the Latin vivere, to live. Sister Thomas Teresa made sure he learned that. So perhaps he could recapture that feeling from growing things. That possibility had been his hope. Here comes Hillsboro, a place to make it happen, to be fruitful and multiply after a fashion. He had had Mayberry RFD delusions, he knew, but he was not a total fool. He had never been a birder and doubted he'd ever take up that passive obsession, but he did get a thrill when he caught a sight of a cardinal or a robin doing that iconic thing, plucking a worm from the ground. Norman Rockwell could have painted that. It made Craig Rogers sigh, unlike the owl. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> that swooped over his car one preternaturally dark night, a classic horror story night with a storm coming up and the great hundred-year-old pecan tree swaying and rustling and groaning violently against the backdrop of ominous clouds. The thing was eagle big, rotund, its wingspan improbably long and wide, like some avenging angel. And the speed of the thing through the wind, commanding the air more than riding it, Craig Rogers was shaking when he put his key in the door that night. The bugs did take him by surprise, too. More than a little aback, the mosquitoes and the moths and the flies and the yellow jackets that swarmed around him one day as he tried to move a long dead tree, they attacked him like F-16s. The pain was ferocious. He screamed and hollered like a little girl. And the wee beasties blew, drew blood. He now knew to be afraid of anything flying that was yellow. <laughs> and yes, there had been squirrels aplenty in New Jersey, but these North Carolina squirrels struck him like drug-addled, sex-crazed hooligans. <laughs> he asked his neighbor if there were always this many scampering this about. Some years more, she said. She had put up one of those squirrel-proof bird feeders with, and filled it with seed. The acrobatic squirrels always got to it, like one of those high-wire acts shimmying down the line. This struck the good doctor as wrong. Early on, he began, he began to carry a grudge against the squirrels. The raccoons baffled him. The way they walked, the way they tried to muscle their way into the garbage cans after midnight like furry ninjas. <laughs> the way they looked at you when you caught them. They're almost human, almost delicate black hands, both miracle and threat. The raccoons and the squirrels made him root for the scary owl. <laughs> snakes? Nobody told him there would be snakes. <laughs> He called the real estate agent almost hysterical when the black snake came and pulled up in a puddle on his front porch. The realtor's tone was that of a nurse trying to talk down a schizophrenic. <laughs> Dr. Rogers, I seriously doubt it's poisonous. It's not even copperhead season yet. <laughs> copperhead season. But Craig Rogers was not one easily deterred. He enjoyed going to the new Home Depot despite buying too many things, things he knew he would probably not use ever. The possibilities enthralled him, the shapes of shovels, the smell of newly milled wood, the multiplicity of nails and trowels and pots and power tillers. He had already befriended the folk who worked at the two nurseries. They knew him by name and loved to give him advice and were quick to order new varieties of whatever genus of tarragon he had read about the night before. One fine morning, early it was, he walked, he wanted to be on time for a meeting with a visiting specialist. One time, only time for one cup of coffee, but that ritual was de rigueur if his day was to work outright. 
He stood over the sink, drinking his cup of ambition, admiring the last wisps of a disappearing fog, glad to see it was going. It stood so still. He had heard talk down at the hardware store on King Street about bucks and points. Five points. What were points? <laughs> he had asked. The good old boys had chuckled at him. Of how many points this deer wore atop his majestic head, Dr. Craig Rogers was unsure. But the elaborate adornment bewitched him. The elegance of his frame, the articulate grace of the lines, the power of which his stance bespoke, the dun and speckled pelt, an, infinite, an infinitely dense set. And though he knew it was a lie, the good doctor knew someplace inside himself that the buck was looking across the backyard, across his Swiss shard and rocket, <laughs> through the double paneled window, directly at him, into him. So very, very still. Though Craig was not big on photography, it occurred to him to go get his camera to create some evidence of this presence. But it came to him that by the time he found it probably filled with dead batteries anyway, and return the grand creature would be gone. It was so still. He stood over the sink, forgetting time, and noticed by and by that his coffee had grown cold, and the spell slacked, and he knew he must go about his day. He was surely going to be late. He grabbed his bag and his jacket and rushed out the door as if the promise of a premonition, the buck had vanished. He would go about his day trying to ungrow the growths that grew in his patient's metastasis from the Latin, from the Greek, to change, to set. He would return home, he would take out pen and paper, and he would try to try again. So. And one more. Okay, I didn't lie, did I? Uh, this is, I, I got this email, I don't know, about two years ago, and I was in a good mood. I think I just had a chicken salad sandwich. <laughs> with white grapes. Because if you don't have white grapes in your chicken salad, you just aren't living. And you can put the white grapes in your chicken salad. So I was in a good mood and this email said, we're doing an anthology of Texas and North Carolina writers. Would you like to contribute? And I was in a good mood and it was like a year or two away, that's sure. And promptly forgot about it. And then later they contacted me and said, we look forward to your story. And, oh, shoot. And, uh, why are you doing this? Why Texas? And North? It, does, it still doesn't make sense. Um, and Jill is in this one. Too. You, you don't even know you're in it. You're in it, honey. Uh, it's called Shared Voices. And they sent me to, so there's six stories by uh, Texans. And then they ask six North Carolinians to write stories you know, in rejoinder to them. And there's six stories by North Carolinians and they asked six Texans to write rejoinders to them. So that's how it goes. I don't know why, but that's what, and um, so I, so they get, sent me one story. It was a pretty good story, a first person story about a football player. And we know, and I felt I had seen the high school football, Texas. I didn't have anything to say about that. And, um, and then they sent a story about uh, a farmer uh, in East Texas who is obsessed with his uh, tombstone, and he wants it to be a reaper, not like the grim reaper, but the actual corn <laughs> reaper. Corn, and and he's, he keeps going and bugging the people at the, at the monument place to build this reaper. The guy's name is Jay uh, Asperson, I think, who wrote the original story. So I like that one. And his wife is very lovely in the story. She, um, she, she thinks he's nuts, but she supports him anyway in getting this, getting this monument built. And so I wrote a story in response to that, and um, and it doesn't matter. These are it's, it takes place in Thames Creek, North Carolina, and um, there's some characters uh, I I like revisiting characters. 
So um, you don't know, need to know anything else. Uh, it's called Ezekiel Saw the Wheel. And I want to thank you again for coming out on this cold, this chilly, beautiful, chilly, wet Sunday. And I, have, I had a great time this year with you guys, and I'm going to miss you. <laughs> I'm going to miss you so much. <laughs> I don't have a word. Um, Ezekiel Saw the Wheel. Gloria dreamt her daughter would die in a helicopter. Tamar was a master sergeant in the army due to fly out for her third tour next Thursday. Tamar's birthday going away party was later that very day. Tamar's father, Gloria's ex-husband and business partner, would be there. Gloria needed to stop by and pick up the cake, a giant rectangular shaped red velvet cake, Tamar's favorite. Gloria kept glancing at the clock on the wall. She needed to go soon. The man sat in silence for the last, had sat in silence for the last 10 minutes, perhaps longer. Gloria was not really sure, but this sort of awkward silence was part of her job had been since the beginning. People would be surprised how often exactly this sort of thing happened. News of the recently deceased, especially someone mighty close, sometimes conjured up something like paralysis, as if the mind had gone offline, shut down to reboot. The man and his wife had been taking a long postponed trip to the Outer Banks, the story was that she had kin there, though she had never met them, nor did they try to connect on this particular visit, and the couple had been on their way to Wilmington when she was stricken by a massive stroke at a Hardee's in Crosstown. The coroner had a bug up his behind, as he himself said one cold morning out back behind the county offices, cigarette dang dangling from the corner of his mouth, about any corporate-run funeral homes, so he always contracted out to independents. Today, he called Gloria and Ray. Got an out-of-towner for y'all. What followed was paperwork, largely a few phone calls and an awkward conversation with a man who had not planned on driving home alone. Gloria asked the man, who sat still in silence, is there someone I can call to come drive you back to Texas, sir? She could tell when it was about to happen. She could almost see it happening, like watching the lights at the top of a tower switching off, going dim right before your eyes, one level at a time, radio silence. For some reason, these silences never bothered her. Her ex-husband once told her she was simply intuitive, and a natural empath. At the time, Gloria had no clue what he had meant. Gloria wanted to call the cake maker to make sure the big red cake would be ready. She felt certain it would be, but she had a tendency to worry about things of this nature, things over which she had some control. Things like a grieving widower, for some reason, perturbed her much less. Indeed, she could tell he was not the sort of man who wanted someone to come and sit next to him to hold his hand and say those things a mortuary professional was expected to say, practiced, road-tested, proverbs and reassurances as eye-catching and non-threatening as fruit baskets, delivered with highly convincing sincerity, which paradoxically cannot be faked. Last night's dream had been in technicolor, filled with swirling dust and lots of cussing. Big boys in sand-colored boots, the sand-colored camouflage Gloria had come to hate seeing in airports, anywhere. She dreamt a dream of blood. She dreamt a dream of helicopter blades going swoosh, swoosh, and swoosh and then stopping, just like in the movies Gloria had watched about the troops in Iraq. Black Hawk Down, Jarhead, and the TV series on Lifetime. She had gone in and out of periods of watching and reading lots of media about the war. Some weeks she tried to pretend, tried to imagine, Tamar was coaching basketball at a small school or teaching. 
until she got an email from her daughter or did that talking through the computer that never seemed to work right. Or it was time to send off a care package. In truth, she spent little time not thinking about her oldest daughter being 7,437 miles away from home, more or less thereabouts. The dream tasted like reality and had the weight of the evidence of things not seen and the substance of things yet to come. And Gloria wanted to talk to her pastor, but a new pastor, all armed with his MDiv from Union Theological Seminary and his MSW from Chapel Hill, would try to interpret the dream and talk about Alice Miller or some psychologist. Couldn't the man see she'd been dealing with dreams and death for the last 30 years? She wasn't exactly a pullet. This sort of thing the pastor had done before. Gloria stopped eventually trying to talk to him about her dreams. She knew when a dream was a dream and when a dream was more than a dream. This one felt like something more than a dream and she knew there was not a thing she could do about it but pray. Tamar was getting on that plane and Gloria was bound to see her off, send her off, cling to faith, see what the Lord had in store. Hope, pray, be humble, believe, Soon and very soon, Gloria would finish up here with this gentleman, finish taking the transfer making the transfer arrangements with the funeral home in Texas, escort this gentleman out, lock up, and fetch the red velvet cake. There was still plenty of time. She would arrive home and find her younger daughter, Eunice, so capable and reliable despite her seemingly silly and frivolous nature her inexhaustible need to gossip, and her overweening need for attention. Eunice and her five children and her dour husband, who seemed only happy when watching basketball or football. Gloria would find Lilith already in the kitchen, finishing up something delicious, something old, something new, showing off her almost supernatural skills, not so much as showing off as an offering of herself, her abundance and ingratiation. I am doing this, putting forth this effort so that you will like me, Mrs. Brown, and there is so much to like, and if you do not like me, something must be wrong with you. Sometimes it took Gloria aback, startled her when she considered how well she got along with how much she actually liked and enjoyed her older daughter, Tamar's girlfriend. Indeed thought of her as her own daughter, though in a guarded sense. Lord knows, in so many ways, Lilith trumped her, either of her two girls as women, despite her affliction. But the Lord loved her just the same, the same as she loved Tamar. This lesson her new pastor was trying to teach her had been teaching her, and what a blessing it was now to release the unease and vexation she had been harboring lo these many years since before Tamar played varsity basketball and all those loud whispers came from behind her back like coiled and poisonous vipers. But the Lord said, you shall handle venomous snakes and yet live. Amen. This Gloria Brown had done many, many times. Gloria sighed out loud. She grimaced when she realized she had troubled the silence. How long had they been sitting here? Gloria imagined Lilith sitting where this abject Texan now sat. Gloria allowed herself to wonder how Lilith would process Tamar's demise with cold, icy, machine-like efficiency, or with the light butterfly warmth that seemed to accompany almost anything she did, surrounded by doves, rainbows, and unicorns? Or would she suddenly reveal the seams in her stitchwork, unravel, allow the tears and the snot to run, and jump aboard the grief train, full of howls and woe? incoherent and feeling the growing void inside? Or would she be like this stoic Texan before Gloria, incapable of speech, downright cataleptic with fear? Gloria knew that fear. She prayed, Lord, don't let my baby die over yonder. 
You are God, you send us signs and wonders, and your will shall be done. Your ways are not our ways. Your ways are mysterious and awesome to behold. But you said, Lord, yes, you did, that the prayers of a righteous man, a righteous woman, availeth much. Let not harm befall my girl, dear Lord, our Father. Protect her as you have protected her, and I shall remain your humble servant. The man was just staring, was staring directly at Gloria. And for a moment, she feared she had been praying in words and not in her mind. As the stare continued unbroken, she knew it was something more, a recognition, something shared, something ineffable, very like the passing of an angel in the darkness of the night. Listen. Gloria Brown was very good at listening. Mazel tov. <laughs>